The Illegal, Unjust Trial of Christ, 26, 57-68, 16 And those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. But Peter also was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and entered in, and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus, in order that they might put him to death, and they did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. But later on two came forward, and said, This man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said to him, Do you make no answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself, nevertheless I tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes, saying, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy, what do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists, and others slapped him, and said, Prophecy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? 26, 57-68 The Jews had always prided themselves on their sense of fairness and justice, and rightly so. The judicial systems in the modern Western world have their foundations in the legal system of ancient Israel, which itself was founded on the standards set forth in their scriptures, the Old Testament. The essence of the Old Testament system of jurisprudence is found in Deuteronomy, You shall appoint for yourself judges and officers in all your towns which the Lord your God is giving you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not distort justice you shall not be partial, and you shall not take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts. Perverts the words of the righteous. Justice, and only justice, you shall pursue, that you may live and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you. 16, 18-20, as the Hebrews worked out specific judicial procedures following those general principles, they determined that any community that had at least 120 men who were heads of families could form a local council. In later years, after the Babylonian exile, that council often was composed of the synagogue leadership. The council came to be known as a Sanhedrin, from a Greek term, Sundrion, that had been transliterated into Hebrew and Aramaic, as it now is into English. It literally means sitting together. A local Sanhedrin was composed of up to 23 members, and the great Sanhedrin in Jerusalem was composed of 70 chief priests, elders, and scribes, with the high priest making a total of 71. In both the local and great Sanhedrins an odd number of members was maintained in order to eliminate the possibility of a tie vote. When referring to the national body in Jerusalem, Sundrion is usually translated Council in the New American Standard Bible, c. E. G. Matt. 26, 59, Mark 14, 55, and when referring to a local body is translated court, see Matt. 5, 22, 10, 17, Mark 13, 9. As we learn from Luke, the great Sanhedrin in Jerusalem was also sometimes referred to as the Senate of the Sons of Israel, Acts 5, 21, or the Council of the Elders. Luke 22, 66, Acts 22, 5. Members of local Sanhedrins were to be chosen because of their maturity and wisdom, and the great Sanhedrin was to be composed of those who had distinguished themselves in a local council and had served a form of apprenticeship in the national council. But long before Jesus' day, membership in the great Sanhedrin had degenerated largely into appointments based on religious or political favoritism and influence. The Herods, especially Herod the Great, exercised considerable control over the great Sanhedrin, and even the pagan Romans sometimes became involved in the appointment or removal of a high priest.
the general requirements of fairness and impartiality prescribed in Deuteronomy 16, 18 to 20 and elsewhere in the Mosaic law were reflected in the rabbinical requirements that guaranteed an accused criminal the right to a public trial, to defense counsel, and conviction only on the testimony of at least two reliable witnesses. Trials were therefore always open to public scrutiny, and the defendant had the right to bring forth evidence and witnesses in his own behalf, no matter how damning the evidence and testimony against him might be. To guard against false witnessing, whether given out of revenge or for a bribe, the Mosaic Law prescribed that a person who knowingly gave false testimony would suffer the punishment the accused would suffer if found guilty, deuterium. 19, 16 to 19. A person who gave false testimony in a trial that involved capital punishment, for example, would himself be put to death. For obvious reasons, that penalty was a strong deterrent to perjury and an effective protection of justice. An additional deterrent was the requirement that accusing witnesses in a capital case were to initiate the execution, making them stand behind their testimony by action as well as words, deuterium. 17, 7. It was that law to which Jesus made indirect reference when he told the accusers of the woman taken in adultery, he who is without sin among you let him be the first to throw a stone at her, John 8, 7. Rabbinical law required that a sentence of death could not be carried out until the third day after it was rendered and that during the intervening day the members of the court were to fast. That provision had the effect of preventing a trial during a feast, when fasting was prohibited. The delay of execution also provided additional time for evidence or testimony to be discovered in the defendant's behalf. Simon Greenleaf was a famous professor of law at Harvard University in the last century. In his book The Testimony of the Evangelists, Jersey City, New Jersey, Frederick P. Lynn, 1881, pp. 581-84, a section written by lawyer Joseph Salvador gives fascinating and significant information about proper Sanhedrin trial procedure. Because a defendant was protected against self, incrimination, his confession, no matter how convincing, was not sufficient in itself for conviction. On the day of the trial, according to Salvador, the court officers would require all evidence against the accused person to be read in the full hearing of open court. Each witness against him would be required to affirm that his testimony was true to the best of his knowledge and was based on his own direct experience and not on hearsay or presumption. Witnesses also had to identify the precise month, day, hour, and location of the event about which they testified. A council itself could not initiate charges against a person but could only consider charges brought before it by an outside party. A woman was not allowed to testify because she was considered to lack the courage to give the first blow if the accused were convicted and sentenced to death. Children could not testify because of their immaturity, nor could a slave a person of bad character, or a person who was considered mentally incompetent. There was always to be presumption of innocence, and great latitude was given the accused in presenting his defense. In a local council, eleven votes out of the total of twenty, three were required for acquittal, but thirteen were required for conviction. If the accused was found innocent, he was freed immediately. But if he was found guilty, the sentence was not pronounced until two days later and, as mentioned above, the council members were required to fast during the intervening day. On the morning of the third day the council was reconvened, and each judge, in turn, was asked if he had changed his decision. A vote for condemnation could be changed to acquittal, but not the reverse. If a guilty verdict was reaffirmed, an officer with a flag remained near the council while another officer, often mounted on horseback, escorted the prisoner to the place of execution. A herald went before the slow, moving procession declaring in a loud voice, this man stating his name is led to punishment for such a crime, the witnesses who have sworn against him are such and such persons, if anyone has evidence to give in his favor, let him come forth quickly. If, at any time before the sentence was carried out, additional information pertaining to innocence came to light, including the prisoner's recollection of something he had forgotten, one officer would signal the other, and the prisoner would be brought back to the council for reconsideration of the verdict. 
before the place of execution was reached, the condemned person was urged to confess his crime, if he had not already done so, and was given a stupefying drink to dull his senses and thereby make his death less painful. The governing principle in capital cases was, the Sanhedrin is to save, not destroy, life. In addition to the above provisions, the President of the Council was required to remind prospective witnesses of the preciousness of human life and to admonish them to be certain their testimony was both true and complete. No criminal trial could be begun during or continued into the night, the property of an executed criminal could not be confiscated but was passed to his heirs, and voting was done from the youngest member to the oldest in order that the former would not be influenced by the latter. And if a council voted unanimously for conviction, the accused was set free, because the necessary element of mercy was presumed to be lacking. It is obvious that, when properly administered, the Jewish system of justice was not only eminently fair but merciful. It is just as obvious that the system did not operate either fairly or mercifully in Jesus' trial, because the Sanhedrin violated virtually every principle of its own system of jurisprudence. Jesus was illegally tried without first having been charged with a crime. He was tried at night and in private, no defense was permitted him, and the witnesses against him had been bribed to falsify their testimony. He was executed on the same day he was sentenced, and, consequently, the judges could not have fasted on the intervening day that should have transpired and had no opportunity to reconsider their verdict. The only procedure that was properly followed was the offering of the stupefying drink, but that was done by Roman soldiers not by representatives of the Sanhedrin, Mark 15, 23. As is clear from the Gospel accounts, Jesus had two major trials, one Jewish and religious and the other Roman and secular. Because Rome reserved the right of execution to its own courts and administrators, the Sanhedrin was not allowed to dispense capital punishment, John 18, 31. The fact that it did so on several occasions, as with the stoning of Stephen, Acts 6, 12-14, 7, 54-60, does not prove the legality of it. It is likely, however, that many illegal executions by the Sanhedrin were simply overlooked by Roman authorities for the sake of political expediency. For them, the loss of a single life was a small price to pay to keep order and peace. The only blanket exception that Rome granted was for the summary execution of a Gentile who trespassed a restricted area of the temple. It is also significant that both the Jewish religious and Roman secular trials of Jesus had three phases, meaning that, within about twelve hours, Jesus faced legal proceedings on six separate occasions before his crucifixion. The Jewish trial began with his being taken before the former high priest Annas in the middle of the night. Annas then sent him to the presiding high priest, Caiaphas, who had quickly convened the Sanhedrin at his own house. Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin met a second time after daylight on Friday morning. After the Jewish religious leaders had concluded their sham hearings, they took Jesus to the Roman procurator, Pilate, first of all because they could not carry out a death sentence without his permission. But they also went to him because a Roman crucifixion would help obscure their own nefarious involvement in what they knew were totally unjust proceedings and condemnation. When Pilate discovered Jesus was a Galilean, he sent him to Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea, who was in Jerusalem for the Passover. After being questioned and treated with contempt by Herod and his soldiers, Jesus was sent back to Pilate, who reluctantly consented to his crucifixion. Matthew 26, 57-68 reveals at least five aspects of that illegal and unjust treatment of our Lord, the convening of the Sanhedrin, vv. 57-58, the conspiracy to convict Jesus without evidence, vv. 59-61, the confrontation to induce his self, incrimination, vv. 62-64, the condemnation based on false charges and testimony, vv. 65-66, and the conduct of the court in the physical and verbal abuse of Jesus, vv. 67-68. The illegal and unjust convening of the Sanhedrin and those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together.
but Peter also was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and entered in, and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. 26, 57-58, After the disciples fled in fear, the temple police, Roman soldiers and the others who had seized Jesus then led him away. But we learn from John that, before they took him to Caiaphas, they led him to Annas first, for he was father, in, law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, John 18, 13. Some twenty years earlier, Annas had served as high priest for a period of four or five years. But although he had been replaced as ruling high priest, he not only continued to carry the title but also continued to wield great influence in temple affairs, largely through the five sons who succeeded him and now through Caiaphas, his son, in, law it was God's design for high priests to serve for life. But the position had become so politicized that some of them served only a few years or even months, because they came into disfavor with a king or a Roman official. Some scholars believe that Annas had been removed from office by Rome because they feared too much power was being amassed by one man. Annas controlled the temple money changers and sacrifice sellers to such an extent that their operations were sometimes referred to as the bazaars of Annas. It is likely that no temple merchant could operate without being approved by Annas and agreeing to give him a large percentage of the profits. A Jew never came to the temple empty, handed. He always brought either a gift of money or a sacrifice to offer the Lord. But he could not offer Gentile coins, because they often carried the likeness of a ruler, which was considered a form of idolatry. Since the vast majority of coins used during New Testament times were either Roman or from a Gentile country under Roman control, Jews had to exchange such coins for Jewish ones before they could place their offerings in the bell, shaped receptacles in the temple. And because the money changers in the temple held a monopoly, they were able to charge exorbitant exchange fees. A Jew who came to offer a sacrifice to God had to use an unblemished animal that had been certified by the priests. And although he could legitimately bring one of his own animals, the corrupt priests who were in charge of certification would seldom accept an animal not bought from a temple merchant. Like those who needed to exchange their money, Jews who wanted to sacrifice were at the mercy of Annas's temple establishment. It was for that reason that Jesus had twice cleansed the temple of the money changers and sacrifice sellers, declaring in anger that they had profaned his father's house of prayer by making it a den of robbers, John 2, 13-17, Mark 11, 15-17. It was immediately after the second cleansing that the infuriated temple authorities began seeking how to destroy him, Mark. 11, 18. Jesus was a persistent threat to Annas's power, prestige, security, and prosperity, for which he was bitterly despised by the high priest. In addition to that, Annas resented Jesus for his holiness, truth, and righteousness, because those virtues were a judgment on his own vile character. Everything Jesus said and did angered Annas, because, like Judas, his absolute rejection of Christ had placed him utterly in the hands of Satan, the great choreographer who was staging this heinous travesty against God's Son. Annas was one of a large cast of characters who were now manipulated by hell. Annas may have instructed the arresting officials to bring Jesus to him first, or the officials may have reasoned that a charge against Jesus by such a powerful dignitary would not be contested when he was brought before the Sanhedrin for trial. In any case, Taking him first to Annas allowed Caiaphas time to assemble the Sanhedrin at his own house, cv. 59. Although Annas had many personal reasons for hating Jesus and wanting him dead, his first comments to the Lord indicate that he was still searching for a capital charge that would appear legal. In questioning Jesus about his disciples, and about his teaching, John 18, 19, Annas violated two major procedural requirements. First, he had Jesus arraigned before an indictment was brought against him, and, second, he tried to induce Jesus to incriminate himself. Jesus did not answer the question directly, but his response was a stinging exposure and indictment of Annas's duplicity and chicanery. I have spoken openly to the world, he said, I always taught in synagogues, and in the temple, where all the Jews come together, and I spoke nothing in secret.
why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them, behold, these know what I said, John 18, 20-21. Jesus merely pointed out the obvious. Countless thousands had heard him teach and preach and could testify first, hand about who his disciples were and about what he taught. Jesus also, in effect, challenged Anas's illegal attempt to make him testify against himself. Anas was embarrassed, infuriated, and frustrated. Because of their complicity, the entire assemblage was also angered, and one of the officers, perhaps to help his superior save face, gave Jesus a blow, saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? John 18, 22 Some years later, the Apostle Paul was brought before the Sanhedrin and, like his Lord, was struck simply for telling the truth. But unlike his Lord, he became angry and vehemently rebuked the presiding officer for his illegal treatment. Only when he learned that he was addressing the high priest did he apologize, Acts 23, 1-5. Jesus, however, never lost his composure, accepting his abuse with perfect calmness. He simply said to the officer who struck him, If I have spoken wrongly, bear witness of the wrong, but if rightly, why do you strike me? John 18, 23 In complete exasperation and having no other recourse, Anas therefore sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest, v. 24. It was the middle of the night, perhaps shortly after midnight, because cock crowing, which normally began about 3, 0, 0 a.m., had not yet started, see Matt. 26, 74. Jesus was then brought before Caiaphas, the high priest, at whose house the scribes and the elders were illegally gathered together as the Supreme Jewish Council, cv. 59. Contrary to expectations, however, no charge had yet been brought against him. The High Court of Judaism had been illegally convened at night to illegally try a man who had not even been indicted. Though not as clever as his father, in law, Caiaphas was equally devious and corrupt. He, too, was greedy, unprincipled, materialistic, and power-hungry. He, too, despised Jesus' truthfulness and righteousness because they were a judgment on his own wretched ungodliness. During this time, Peter also was following Jesus at a distance, first to the house of Annas and then as far as the courtyard of the high priest Caiaphas. Out of a conflicting mixture of cowardice and commitment, Peter tried to be as near his Lord as prudence permitted without being discovered, and he sat down with the officers to see the outcome. The fact that Peter and others were sitting in the courtyard of the high priest reveals still another infraction of Jewish legal protocol. As previously noted, the Sanhedrin was permitted to hold a trial involving capital punishment only in the temple and only in public. The private meeting at Caiaphas's house clearly violated both stipulations. The illegal and unjust conspiracy to convict Jesus now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus, in order that they might put him to death, and they did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. But later on two came forward, and said, This man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. 26, 59-61 the chief priests are mentioned separately probably because they were the primary instigators of Jesus' arrest, cv. 47. But as Matthew makes clear, the whole council, or Sanhedrin, was present. The council was empowered to act only as judge and jury in a legal proceeding. They could not instigate charges but could only adjudicate cases that were brought before them. But because they as yet had no formal charge against Jesus, they were forced to illegally act also as prosecutor in order to carry out their predetermined plan to convict and execute him. Consequently, they kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus, in order that they might put him to death. Because Jesus was innocent of any wrongdoing, the only possible way to convict him would be on the basis of false testimony. His accusers would have to be liars. Because the council was so controlled by satanic hatred of Jesus, they now were willing to do whatever was necessary to condemn him, 
even if that meant violating every biblical and rabbinical rule of justice. To accomplish their wicked conspiracy they found themselves perverting the very heart of the Sanhedrin's purpose, stated earlier in this chapter, to save, not destroy, life. Their purpose now, however, was not to discover the truth about Jesus and certainly not to save his life. Their single, compelling desire was to put him to death. But try as they would, they did not find any legitimate charges against him, even though many false witnesses came forward. During that first attempt to manufacture a charge, even the many false witnesses who were willing to perjure themselves could not devise a story that would stand scrutiny even in that corrupt and biased proceeding. Their testimonies not only were spurious but grossly inconsistent with each other, Mark 14, 56, as is typically the case with liars. The frustration of the assembly continued to mount until later on two witnesses finally came forward with a charge that seemed usable. They asserted that Jesus stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Mark's more detailed account reports that they claimed Jesus said, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands, Mark 14, 58. Or perhaps Matthew reported one of the witnesses' words and Mark the others, in which case the testimony even of those two men was not consistent. Jesus' actual words were, Destroy this temple, and in 3 days one will raise it up, John 2, 19, and his hearers concluded that he was referring to the Jerusalem temple building he had just cleansed, v. 20. The two false witnesses not only shared that false assumption but accused Jesus of saying, on the one hand, that he himself was able to destroy the temple of God, and on the other, I will destroy this temple, Mark 14, 58, emphasis added. Mark notes that not even in this respect was their testimony consistent, v. 59. In addition to the inconsistency of their statements, which itself made the testimonies inadmissible in a legitimate hearing, the two men did not relate the year, month, day and location of the incident they claimed to have witnessed, as they were required to do by law. The fact that not a single witness could be found to convict Jesus of wrongdoing is one of the strongest apologetic in all of scripture for his moral and spiritual perfection. If any fault could have been found in him it would have come to light. Even if demons had to provide the information, it would certainly have been presented. Demons are not omniscient, but they would have known of any sin Jesus committed had he been guilty of it, and they would have rushed to produce such evidence against him through their wicked minions in the Sanhedrin. But neither Jesus' human nor demonic enemies could find in him the least transgression of God's moral or spiritual law. His only transgressions had been against the man, made, legalistic, and unscriptural rabbinic traditions. The ones who were ultimately on trial that day were those who stood in judgment of the perfect, sinless Son of God. That tribunal of sinful, unjust, and hate, filled men will one day stand before God's heavenly tribunal and themselves be eternally condemned to the lake of fire. The illegal and unjust confrontation to induce self, incrimination and the high priest stood up and said to him, Do you make no answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself, nevertheless I tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. 26, 62-64 the frustration of the council members became unbearable as they desperately tried to get the trial concluded before dawn, when people would start milling about the city and their illegal venture would risk being discovered. They also, no doubt, wanted to conclude the affair quickly so they could make preparations for their own Passover sacrifices and duties that afternoon. Trying again to steer Jesus into self, incrimination, the high priest and presiding officer therefore said to him, Do you make no answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? Probably gazing squarely into Caiaphas's eyes, Jesus kept silent, adding still more to the high priest's consternation. Since the testimonies of the two men were inconsistent, they should have been rejected by the court.
a rebuttal by Jesus not only would have been futile but would have given the false testimony and the entire illegal proceedings the appearance of legitimacy. Jesus stood majestically silent. It was the silence of innocence, the silence of dignity, the silence of integrity, the silence of infinite trust in his heavenly Father. It was a silence in which the lying words against him reverberated in the ears of the guilty judges and of the false witnesses they had bribed. Goaded by that silence, which accentuated the travesty of justice over which he presided, the enraged high priest continued to badger Jesus, saying, I adjure you by the living God, that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Appealing to the most sacred oath a Jew could utter, Caiaphas demanded that Jesus either affirm or deny his messiahship and deity. He was saying, in effect, answer my question truthfully, on the basis that you are standing before the living God, who knows all things. Although none of the council, except Joseph of Arimathea, if he was still present, believed in Jesus' deity, they were strongly hoping he would openly make that claim for himself so that they could charge him with blasphemy. The Mosaic law provided that the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death, Lef. 24, 16. But a claim to deity would be blasphemous only if it were false, which it would be for any human being ever born except Jesus. Although he had never flaunted or made public issue of his messiahship and deity, he had given numerous attestations. Attestations to both, beginning early in his ministry. In the synagogue at his hometown of Nazareth, he read a well-known messianic passage from Isaiah and then declared, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, Luke 4, 18-21. His first specific claim to messiahship was made to the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. In response to her statement that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, Jesus said, I who speak to you am he, John 4, 25-26. He had readily accepted the messianic epithets shouted to him as he entered Jerusalem the previous Monday, Matt. 21, 9. He continually referred to God as his heavenly Father, which the Jewish leaders rightly interpreted as a claim of deity, John 5, 17-18, and he had declared to the unbelieving Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, before Abraham was born, I am, John 8, 58, taking that ancient appellation of God, cx. 3, 14, for himself. Jesus finally gave the affirmation the Sanhedrin had been waiting to hear. You have said it yourself, he replied. Mark's account makes the acknowledgement of messiahship and deity even more explicit, as he quotes Jesus saying directly, I am, Mark 14, 62. Then, referring to Psalm 110, 1 and Daniel 7, 13, Jesus added, Nevertheless I tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Not only am I the Messiah and the Son of God, he was saying, but one day you will see me glorified with my Father in heaven and returning to earth as your judge, cf. Matt. 25, 31-46 Son of Man was a commonly acknowledged title of the Messiah, the one Jesus most often used of himself, and power was a figurative designation of God. Because the ungodly members of the Sanhedrin had refused to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they had sealed their doom to face him at the end time as their judge and executioner. The accused would then become the accuser, and the judges would become the judged. The illegal and unjust condemnation of Jesus then the high priest tore his robes, saying, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy, what do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. 26, 65-66 Upon that unambiguous confession by Jesus, the high priest tore his robes in horror, saying, He has blasphemed. The unbelieving members of the Sanhedrin had long ago discounted Jesus' claims of deity. He had pleaded with them, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me, but if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father, John 10, 35-36.
37 to 38. In other words, even if they could not believe the divine source of his teaching, how could they argue against the divine power behind his countless public miracles? They had closed their minds to the truth, and no amount of evidence would open their eyes to it. Like many people throughout the ages who have rejected Christ, it was not that they had carefully examined the evidence about him and found it to be untrue or unconvincing but that they refused to consider the evidence at all. Even God's own Holy Spirit cannot penetrate such a willful barrier to his truth and grace. Miracles do not convince the hard, hearted. When the high priest ceremoniously tore his robes, he did so not out of grief and indignation over the presumed dishonor of God's name but rather out of joy and relief that, at last, Jesus had placed himself into their hands, condemning himself out of his own mouth. Although Leviticus 21, 10 strictly forbade the high priest's tearing his garments, the Talmud held that judges who witnessed blasphemy had a right to tear their robes if they later sewed them up. By his traditional and theatrical display, Caiaphas dramatically gave the appearance of defending God's name, but inwardly he gloated over the illegal, unjust, and devilish victory he imagined he had just won. What further need do you have of witnesses, he asked the council rhetorically. And with that he asked for an immediate verdict, Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy, what do you think? He did not bother to have the members polled individually and the results tabulated by scribes, as judicial protocol required, but simply called for verbal support of the predetermined conclusion of guilt. With one voice they answered and said, He is deserving of death. The decision was unanimous as they all condemned him to be deserving of death, Mark 14, 64. The unanimous vote to convict should have given Jesus his freedom automatically, because the necessary element of mercy was lacking. But by this time the Sanhedrin had relinquished even the semblance of legality and justice. Because we know that Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the council but did not consent to Jesus' condemnation, Luke 23, 50-51, he obviously had left the proceedings before this final judicial farce transpired. The verdict of guilty and the sentence of death were not based on careful consideration of full and impartial evidence and testimony. It was a senseless mob reaction, much like the one which, a few hours later, these same leaders would instigate. An orchestrate regarding the release of Barabbas and the crucifixion of Jesus, Matt. 27, 20-21 20 The illegal and unjust conduct of the court then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists, and others slapped him, and said, Prophecy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? 26, 67-68, discarding the last vestige of decorum and decency, the Supreme Court of Israel degenerated into a crude, mindless rabble. With total lack of inhibition, the religious aristocracy of Judaism the high priest and chief priests, the elders, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees revealed their true decadence, as some of them spat in Jesus' face and beat him with their fists. To Jews, the supreme insult was to spit in another's face, see number. 12, 14, Deuterium. 25, 9. The impressive tomb of Absalom is still standing in the Kidron Valley just outside Jerusalem. But for thousands of years that monument has been spat on by Jewish passers-by to show their contempt for Absalom's treacherous rebellion against his father, David. Others in the council, perhaps the less rowdy older members, merely slapped him. And instead of spitting on Jesus they threw verbal abuse in his face. After blindfolding him, Luke 22, 64, they demanded sarcastically, Prophecy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? Luke also reports that they were saying many other things against him, blaspheming, 22, 65. The true blasphemers here were the accusers, not the accused. Jesus had not blasphemed because he was indeed God, but the ungodly Sanhedrin blasphemed repeatedly as they condemned, humiliated, and abused the sinless Son of God. And when these judges of Israel tired of tormenting Jesus, they turned him over to the temple police for further maltreatment, Mark 14, 65. As the later mob reaction before Pilate would prove conclusively,
the ungodly religious leaders who rejected and profaned Jesus were a microcosm of the Jewish nation. Spiritually and morally Israel was a rotting carcass waiting to be devoured by vultures, as indeed it was devoured by Rome less than 40 years later. In AD 70 the temple was burned and razed, most of Jerusalem was destroyed, and hundreds of thousands of its citizens were slaughtered without mercy. Every person who rejects Christ spits in his face, as it were, and is guilty of blasphemy against God, who sent his beloved Son to save that person and all mankind from sin. The irony is that all who misjudge Jesus will themselves be rightly judged by him one day. Men continually misjudge Jesus, but he will never misjudge them. The tables will be turned. The criminals will no longer unjustly condemn and crush the innocent but will themselves be justly condemned and crushed. Even in the midst of the cruel injustice against him, our Lord's grace shined undiminished. Throughout his ordeal, while being reviled, he did not revile in return, while suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously, 1 Pet. 2, 23. This was his divinely appointed time, and he resolutely and gladly faced hell's moment of seeming victory. He would not turn or be turned from suffering and death, because only in that way could he bear our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, v. 24.